guys, welcome back. Uh, this is a ShakeTube 2017 video uh, that's a read-along of Shakespeare plays over a 15-week period from the end of August through December, ho hosted by Lukash and Curtis Books and Films. And every week we read a different Shakespeare play, and then on the Friday we post a video of our thoughts on that particular play. This week we're reading Henry V. This is essentially a war play. Uh, England and France have been in constant war over the rightful succession to the French crown. And at the kind of goading of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Henry has kind of uh, put in some demands to France over some dukedoms that he has a rightful heir to. And he doesn't get a favorable response back. The Dauphin, who is actually the son of the French king, sends um, an interesting response back to him. Um, your Highness lately sending into France did claim some certain dukedoms in the right of your great predecessor, King Edward III, in answer of which claim the prince, our master, says that you savor too much of your youth. This is an ambassador speaking for the Dauphin. He therefore sends you meter for your spirit, this ton of treasure, and in lieu of this, desires that you let the dukedoms that you claim hear no more of you. What treasure does he send him? Tennis balls. Um, it's basically a slap in the face. Uh, he is kind of making fun of, of Henry. He doesn't take him seriously. He remembers Henry in his youth, in his wilder days, not as a king, um, and Henry has changed. Henry's response, which I, I really loved, was, uh, When we have matched our rackets to these balls, we will in France, by God's grace, play a set, shall strike his father's crown into the hazard. His pride's been hurt. He is now um, basically going after the crown of France, uh, which he also has a rightful claim to. And it's going to end up in this big battle at Agincourt. Uh, now, this is a grand thing to put on stage, a big, vastly fields of France, um, a great battle. And Shakespeare has this really interesting technique where he creates a chorus. And it's basically one man, a narrator, at the beginning of the play, and he appears again at various uh, parts throughout to kind of set the scene and help the audience imagine what they can't quite put on stage. Uh, so I'd like the opening. Uh, oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. But pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised spirits that hath dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty field to France? Or may we cram within this wooden O the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt? Um, so, yeah, like I said, he pops up from time to time. Um, he pops up again in Act 4. Uh, when he talks about uh, Henry as he's sort of, uh, you know, on the eve of battle and he kind of walks among his men in disguise kind of to get a feel of where their heads are at, you know, where, how do they feel about this, are they prepared, and he gets into some interesting conversations. But I like, I like the way he describes it in the chorus, um, that walking from watch to watch, from tent to tent, let him cry praise and glory on his head, for forth he goes and visits all his hosts bids them good morrow with a modest smile, and calls them brothers, friends, and countrymen. Beholding him plucks comfort from his looks, a little touch of Harry in the night. Um, There's some really great speeches within this, um, particularly Henry has most of them. Um, you have the uh, very famous line uh, when he's really trying to uh, really motivate his soldiers. Uh, once more into the breach, dear friends, once more, or close the wall up with our English dead. In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of a tiger. And this was really great when I saw uh, Kenneth Branagh, you know, do this on uh, in the movie. It was just fantastic. Then, of course, he also has the um, the famous St. Crispian speech. Uh, again, another motivating speech. He overhears some people talking about how, oh, if we only had, um, like, some 10,000 more Englishmen to fight. And he's like, who wishes this so? You know, this would... Um, diminish our, our glory, you know. Uh, if, if we are marked to die, we are enough to do our country loss. And if to live, the fewer men, the greater share of honor. So we'll get more, you know, just doing this on our own and we can, you know, show our battle scars and say we, we earn these um, in honor fighting at uh, Agincourt. Um, so it's, it's, it's a bit one-dimensional. It's just, it's focused on his goal of gaining um, the French crown and the Dauphin kind of constantly underestimating him, although the French king does not, but uh, you don't get a lot of other side to these characters because um, all we are seeing them is in in war in, or preparing for war, um, and then and then it, it gets to the end. <laughs> it's very odd. Um, it's it's I guess to the end of the battle where he's not even sure um, because of the losses and everything. 
Uh, he turns to a messenger from France and says, I tell thee truly, Harold, I know not if the day be ours or no. And then he's told by the, by, by the messenger that the day is yours. And then, then we will call this the field of Agincourt for, on this day of Crispin Crispianus. Uh, and he, you know, everybody kind of collects their dead and, and returns home for a bit. And then he returns to France to lay claim um, to the spoils of war. But instead of sitting down and, and writing out these documents and making, you know, coming to terms and, and agreeing on these, he sends, like, some of his dukes and noblemen to do the job for him while he goes off and tries to woo um, the princess, uh, the, the king, king of France's daughter, Catherine. Um, there's some cute little, you know, react, in, interactions between the two because neither one really speaks each other's language very well. But it just seems like an odd kind of ending to the play for someone um, who has fought so hard for this crown. You think he'd be there, you know, hammering out all the details and everything. But uh, overall, I love like the the grand deal speeches in it. Um, but well, not necessarily one of my favorite plays. But other than those parts that I really did enjoy, and I enjoyed the movie. I think it was it was much more powerful seeing it visually because then you didn't have to just imagine what the chorus is trying to tell you and filling in the blanks. You could see it, you know. And he did a fantastic job with it. But I still enjoyed reading it, but again, not, not my top most play. Um, one of those is coming up next week. That'll be Hamlet. So I'm really looking forward to, to that one. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you've read this, um, did you like it? What did you think about it? Uh, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye. So Henry V is basically a war play with a romantic comedy at the end.